there, you made it. I'm so happy to see you. Oh, welcome, 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 of course, to the space and place of equipping where learners of his word become lovers of his way and doers of his will. Hallelujah. Come on in, get comfortable. You know, as you're getting your things, as you're gathering yourself, as you're getting comfortable, I want to warm you up with the pretext for what we're going to discuss tonight. And and that would be what was talked about in the beginning, the very beginning of Luke chapter 8. And that is, yes, the parable of the sower. So many of us have heard this story, but it's always good to have a refresher, right? And some of us may know the story by the title parable of the four soils. So whichever, you know, which whichever title you... Um, you prefer to use or brings back or you know evokes that nostalgia and your memory of of what Jesus was saying through this story just latch on to that latch on to that um i want to talk about a couple things before i get into the actual parable uh let's let's talk pretext let's get an idea for an idea of what was going on let's get an idea of the atmosphere so the text discusses where Jesus was and he was he was doing what he was doing, right? So he was going from town to town doing what he and his squad does best, right? They were spreading the word of the kingdom of God and they were sharing it with whomever would listen. Jew, Gentile, none of the above. They were spreading the word and scripture makes mention um, of the of the detail, which you know you and I might find you know frivolous or insignificant, but scripture mentions it. The fact that along with Jesus and the twelve disciples, there were three women: Mary, Mary Magdalene, um, Joanna, and Susanna. And these women followed along and supported the ministry of Jesus and, and, and his disciples. And um, more significantly, they supported the ministry out of their own means. So out of their own work, you know, out of their own finances, what have you, out of their own skill. Whatever they could do to, to support them, they did. And I think the most paramount um, detail of all of this is these women had testimonies of being in sin. And, um, you know, in layman terms, we could say they experienced the worst sin possible, even though we know that, you know, there is no sin that's greater than the other. But scripture makes mention of the fact that these women knew evil spirits and they were delivered from evil spirits. And I believe Mary Magdalene at one point had seven evil spirits. So that's that's pretty significant. And um, anyway, so the fact that they are traveling with Jesus and the 12 disciples after having gone through everything that they went through after being what they once were is incredible. And it's in, it's incredibly encouraging the fact that, you know what, this was once upon a time their identity and Jesus doesn't care. Jesus is drawing all men unto him and he's going about and doing his father's work and sharing the news with whomever will listen. And he's going about and doing his father's work and working alongside whomever will take up their cross and walk with him. So I'm really excited. I'm so excited about this series um, because as you can already tell, there's so much in it. But let me not delay. I'm going to go ahead and begin. We're going to build the, the context for what we're talking about. And I'm going to read to you. The parable of the sower. So if you have your Bibles and you're all settled, 
join me. We are in Luke chapter 8, starting off at verse 4. And scripture reads, While a large crowd was gathering and people were coming to Jesus from town after town, he told this parable. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. It was trampled upon, and the birds of the air ate it up. Some fell on the rock, and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still, other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop, and a hundred times more than what was sown. And when he said this, he called out, Who has ears to hear? Let him hear. Who has ears to hear? What we are getting ready to talk about in this incredible series. Who has ears to hear? I invite you all to hear. I invite you all, as Jesus invited those who were gathered around him, let them hear. Now that's the parable. And if you were like me the first time you read this, and even the second time, third time, what have you, you're asking, well, what does that mean? And so put yourself in the place of these people who are, you know, gathered around Jesus and the disciples, and even the disciples, I'm sure, to some extent are wondering, well, what does that mean? And they're leaning in and they're thinking and they're pondering. Maybe they're whispering, what do you think that is? And then finally someone asked Jesus, it was the disciples. One of the disciples asked Jesus, well, what does that mean? Let's begin. All right, let's get started. Luke chapter 8, meet me at verse 10. Here we go. Verse 10 reads, He said, and this is Jesus speaking, He said, The knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to others I speak in parables, so that though seeing they may not see, though hearing they may not understand. This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. Those along the path are the ones who hear, and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts, so that they may not believe and may be saved. Those on the rock are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but then they have no root. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing, they fall away. The seed that fell among thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, pleasures, and they do not mature. But the seed on good soil stands for those with noble and good heart, who hear the word, who retain the word, and by persevering, produce a crop. And that is the text that we are going to examine today. So there's so much in that. But like faith, we're going to begin with the seed. And many of you have heard, you know, and are aware of the scripture. It talks about where Jesus is encouraging believers to have faith just the size of a mustard seed. And so the question is, what is God why is God using a seed and what is this symbol? What is God expressing to us? Why is God likening, likening the word of God unto a seed? Well, what is it? We know that seeds, seeds bring about everything that we consume and, and all the pretty flowers that we like to enjoy. But what God is saying He's, he's drawing a comparison and he's saying many things, but the seed is the source for which all life sprouts from, right? The seed is alive. 
it contains life. So like the word, we understand is living. Like the word may contain a symbol or a collection of symbols, we understand that there's so much more that comes from that symbol or co collection of symbols. There's so much more understanding. There's so much more meaning. There's so much more wisdom that is conveyed using um, that word or those collections of, of symbols. Let's reflect on the scripture in the word of God. God says in 1 Peter 1 verse 23, for you have been born again, but not to a life that will quickly end. Your new life will last forever because it comes from an internal, an, excuse me, an eternal source. It comes from the everlasting. You have life, which is the seed, but, but once that seed begins to sprout, right? Once we grow, once we, once we begin to leave this place and, and sprout from this place, having received all the, in, the nourishment, all of the, the, the knowledge and the wisdom that comes with living life, we should be sprouting into eternal life. I tell you, God is beautiful. There is no better poet. Shakespeare better put his hat down because my goodness, our God, let me tell you, our God, our God is the source for all creativity. I mean, look at what he is saying. Let's look at another example of, of what the Lord is saying about the word of God as he's using the symbol of a seed. We recognize that seeds produce, I think I said earlier, seeds produce everything that we consume. But let's think about the mechanism of a seed. So we've talked about what the seed is. Let's talk about the mechanism and how the seed works. A seed produces nothing until it is planted. So through this mechanism, we begin to see that having a seed is great, but it requires an economy. It requires a, a a system. It requires um, an environment to thrive. And so because a seed produces nothing until it is planted, we come to understand that it's great to know the Word of God. It's great to have read the Bible from front to back. But if it's not rooted in you, if it is um, if you cannot use those words or call upon those words in that wisdom in a time of trouble, then, then, then what use is it? And let's reflect on the word in Isaiah 55 verse 11. That scripture tells us it is the same way with his word. He sends it out and it always produces what it is, what it sets out to do. It always produces fruit. It will always accomplish all that the Lord has called it to do and it will prosper and he will send it everywhere. That is the mechanism of his word. Like the seed that is planted in good soil, it will take root. It will see you through every season. The seasons of rain, the seasons of drought, the seasons of frigid cold, the, free, the, the season of harsh heat, the storm seasons, you name it. Once his word has taken root in you, you will be able to rely upon it and, and, and use it to recall it no matter what you're going through. The Lord guarantees that it will accomplish what, it's, what, it, what it has been sent to do. That's a promise for fruit. That's a promise for, for product. That's a promise of prosperity. And if we go a little bit deeper, what he's saying in that is like a seed that is planted in good soil. You're, you're not going to, to lose anything. Once a seed is 
planted in good soil, you can be sure that you're going to have a yield and then you can plant accordingly. You might even get lucky and, and have more than what you expected. And because we know the God that we serve many times, that is the case. But let's, let's think about a different aspect of the seed and what the Lord, what the Lord is saying about his word. So you can have, if you are planting a corn seed, right? Kernel of corn, you're going to plant it. You found some sweet soil, super nice. You're excited about it. It's fertilized. You're going to plant that thing and you are going to start searching recipes on the internet for all different types of corn boiled corn, grilled corn, right? You, you've made a plan because you know this soil is good and you have faith in the seed. So you plant the seed in the soil. What would you do if you planted that corn seed and up sprouted a cucumber? What would you do? <laughs> what would you do? I can tell you what I would do. I would pickle the cucumber. No, no. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Let's get back on track. What would you do? And if your answer is you don't know, well, you've got an answer like the rest of us. We don't know. Why? Because that's not what happens. Because with seeds, a seed will always produce its kind. Now I know that we're living in the last days and we've seen some pretty wild things in the world. We've seen some pretty wild things in the world. So let's just roll with our expectation is that a seed of one kind would always produce its own kind. That is the divine design and that is a divine intention and so that's what we're going to rock with but um just acknowledge that right a seed always produces its own kind and so in reference to the word of god you might be hearing um the undertone of you know god is the same today as he was yesterday and he will be tomorrow right he is reliable he is constant he is stable right or you might be hearing the word within you um, speak there's nothing new under the Sun yes and, and and all of this is true so if you're hearing my words and you're thinking about what we're reading and it's starting to connect and you're starting to recall scripture right the scripture that's inscribed on your heart you're starting to recall that and it's coming back into memory good good that's your seed your seed that's planted within you right good i'm happy to hear that but let's just acknowledge that so god is saying that my word is eternal right once you take it in you're not going to get something else if i have told you that nothing no weapon formed against you shall prosper then you shouldn't have the expectation that a water gun somehow would prosper against you. That a, oh, I don't know, if you've grown up with uh, a mother who uses a wooden spoon, okay, let's just think about it. Not a weapon that we think about in the classical sense, but you know what, sometimes they weaponize those things, okay? So, but still, right? So God is saying, even if it is a spoon, a wooden spoon, because you got caught in the kitchen getting cookies out of the cookie jar and your mom, you know, gave you a little remembrance about the order in her house and how her kitchen flows, it's not going to prosper. So no weapon, it doesn't matter what type or how it's fashioned against you, it won't prosper. And God is saying, that because my word is like a seed and seeds always produce its kind you can bet on this oh you can bet on this you can rely on this you can stand on this you can lay down on it if you want to whatever you want to do it's going to stand my word will stand like a seed planted in good soil so let's reflect on the word of god 
In Galatians verse six, excuse me, chapter six, verse seven, the Lord reminds us, don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. So that is a really cool way of saying what we all know and understand that you will reap what you sow. So again, this is another way that God is guaranteeing to us or guaranteeing his word that when you plant this seed in this soil, you can expect a certain harvest, right? So when you are planting or you are sowing uh, discord among the brethren, oh, you can expect that the Lord's not gonna be happy with you. Because if we were called sowing discord among brethren is one of the seven things that the Lord verily hates. So let's just, it's always good to have nice reminders. You don't want to go there. Don't take it there. <laughs> All right, so let's move forward. Let's talk about this path. So breaking down what the Lord is saying, there's so many different elements. What is the path that he's talking about? What is this path? And what's so special about this path? Well, in context of the parable, the path is a, is a set apart lane. Now in some translations, you might hear it referred to as a road or um, a gateway um, or a straight. Uh, many different translations, all the same meaning. Those are pretty much, pretty much all synonyms. Um, for the same thing. And he's talking about the narrow path, the way, right? And he's saying that, he's, he's breaking it down and he's identifying the avenues for which believers find themselves walking out their faith, okay? So the path is where, this first path is where believers begin to discern the word and, and, and then through their discernment, they begin to hear it. So he says that those along that path are the ones who hear, but then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts. The Lord is making a connection and he's drawing a conclusion about what it means to doubt what it means to hear and have a connection but not be sure about it. This is something that believers face all the time. This is, as we are in Holy Week, what I like to call Resurrection Week, this is the reaction that the disciples had when they heard the news that Jesus had risen. They walked with Jesus. They knew Jesus intimately. They beheld the prophecies that were fulfilled. Even the one that really, I believe, just damaged Peter about the rooster crowing and him denying Jesus three times. They knew, they heard, they sat with him as he taught and even in this moment, the depths to teaching that he is going into, that he is pulling apart and sharing with them intimately, how he communicates to believers. He's saying, I don't communicate with you, like, you know, those, I don't communicate in, in just any old way. My communication has a mechanism in it uh, that separates the believers or the hearers from the believers. I can speak to anyone, but those who hear my word, right? Those who, um, let me take a look here. Those whom the secret knowledge of the kingdom of God has been, has been imparted to, they, they, they understand the parable. So the, the parable, to some extent, serves as an encryption. 
right? It serves, that's the mechanism. It acts as an encryption so that those who see don't actually see the truth of it all. And those who hear don't actually understand it all. It takes moments like this. When you are sitting with Jesus, when you are, glory to God, hint, in, entering, I, oh my goodness, entering into his presence, when you are basking in him, when you are chewing on his word, when you are really inquiring about the things of God, they asked him directly, why, what does this mean? And Jesus understanding the language of his people understood that, okay, they don't understand parables. Let me break this down for them. So that's verily what is happening here. And so as we talk about the first category of believers who, who walk the path, right? They're on the path and they are able to discern the word and hear it. But because of what they're faced with in the world, because of, we'll just put an X on that, you name it, they doubt. And so that doubt gives way for the devil to come along and take away the word from their heart so that they may not believe and may not be saved. So the way that sentence is structured, oh my goodness, there are so many conditions. There are so many contingencies. And the Lord is saying, that you have to believe in order to be saved. That you cannot hear and then doubt what you hear. You discard what you've heard or you disregard what you have heard. You leave yourself open to the enemy to still have occupation in your life. No. In order to be saved, these are the things that you have to do, you know, keeping the doors closed, what have you, making sure that the enemy has no territory in your life. Those are safeguards. That's what we do to protect our temple, to protect our faith. And the Lord is saying that your belief is important. Okay, let's go to the, to the second category. So there are those um, who are on a rock. Oh yeah, let's talk about it. Those on the rock, there are those believers who are on the rock and they are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but then they have no root. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing, they fall away. Oh Lord, oh Lord. In the time of testing, they fall away. What I think is especially beautiful about this parable and the care that Jesus is taking to communicate this knowledge to all the people who want to hear. We know it takes place on a path and he refers to the people, right? Uh, those along the path. And there are categories of believers who tread a path in their faith. In the second category, He's talking about the ones who stand on a, on a rock. They pro, Maybe these are the ones who know the word of God. These are the ones who we would say lovingly, right? We would say lovingly that uh, they beat people with uh, the word of God, right? What do they call them? There's a, a term, I think Christians as a whole, among other denominations, are referred to as Bible thumpers, right? Because we take pride in knowing the word. We take pride, and I think to some extent we should. Maybe not the pride part, but we should aspire to know what God said and be able to reproduce that because we're called to wield a, a sword. We're called to, in a moment's notice, to combat a moment of doubt, to combat about a fear. We are called to do this and the way that we do this is through his word. So I'm not saying that knowing the word of God and being able to speak it 
reproduce it with accuracy is bad. No, 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 not at all. But I believe the believers that he's talking about here are the believers who know, but they're not connected. Come on, come on, somebody talk to me in here. The believers who know the word, but it's not inscribed on their heart. There's no scar from the time when they had to learn that word. Come on, somebody. How many of you know the word because something happened in your life that made you never forget it? Something happened in your life that brought you into greater understanding. Come on. David talks about it in Psalm 119.7. He says, Lord, it was good for me to be afflicted because I came into knowing your word better. Come on, somebody. Who has that testimony? That's the reason why the scripture sticks. If, if you're not being, you know, an academic, you're not being scholastic, you know, about pursuing the knowledge of God and you are engaging him with your heart openly. Nine times out of 10, I believe there's gonna be a circumstance that you have either gone through, overcome, endured, something that you witnessed that, that, that left an imprint on your entire being that inscribed that word on your heart and on your mind made it so that you cannot that so that you cannot forget it that's what he's talking about here the second category of believers those who stand on the word of god those who stand on the rock have no roots they have no connection they have no times when or i remember when with god the only thing i had was god had it not been for god if someone didn't come along, oh, when someone came along, it brought me peace. Come on, somebody. That's what he's talking about. And, he, and the beautiful thing about it, so this is my adoration. He's not saying it directly. And if we think as believers, why does God do that? Yes, he's mysterious and he works in mysterious ways, but he wants, it's a beckoning. He wants us to come in. Like the disciple at the beginning of the chapter asked, well, what does that mean? Oh, he wants your inquiry. He wants your intrigue. He wants you to sit with it. He wants you to, to okay, uh, make the connection. The connection with what he's saying and what he created and what actually happens. Come on, somebody. We all can connect to a seed. Oh yeah, we've heard, maybe, I don't know, maybe you're from the South, okay? Cause I've got some relatives who are from the South. And you know, I'll just share this with you. They say down there that if you swallow a watermelon seed, it's gonna grow inside of you, right? It's just a funny thing that, you know, folks used to say down there. And so when you eat watermelon, you always made sure as a kid to, to spit those things out because you didn't want you know, any watermelons growing inside of you. Come on, somebody. Now, present day, that may not be as relevant because I think that our produce is coming away from um, its organic presentation. Um, so seedless watermelons are the thing. Um, but nonetheless, the Lord is giving us little bits that we can chew on. We can, everybody can relate to a seed and understanding how a seed works. So glory to God. I digress, but let's go on to the next category. So now he's talking about the seed that falls among the thorns. Oh, not the thorns. The seed that falls along the thorns. He says, stands for those who hear, but they go on their way. They go on their way, choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures. Oh my goodness. And they do not mature. Oh my goodness. Let's talk about it, guys. He's saying that they acknowledge God's word. They, they, they can see that you're standing there. 
but uh, I'm worried about some other things. This is engagement. Yes, this is an issue of engagement. This is, he's saying that there are some believers. Now let's just do kind of a quick recap before we get into the fourth category. The first category are the believers who believe, but they doubt, okay? The second category are the believers who believe, they hear, like the first category is they hear, they believe, and they're standing on the word, so they know, but they have no connection, they have no relationship with God. And then the third category talks about the believers who don't engage God because of what's going on in their life. Oh, and there's so many things that could be going on. It could be romance. It could be your relationships. It could be uh, the things, heart matters that you're concerned about. It could be money and finances and business and career and, you know, um, getting the most for all of your investment, uh, all of your hard work and working in connection. It could be that. It could be you are completely distressed, you're distraught, you're overwhelmed, there's so much going on, you're sad, oh my goodness, and you forget to, to, to tilt your head up, to look up, right? To look to the hills from whence your help cometh from. These are the woes of life. It could be, I mean, we live in this generation now where we're all snapping selfies. It's like selfie, 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 you know, um, all eyes on me, you know, type of atmosphere that we seem to exist in it could be you name it but the Lord is saying the third category are the believers who believe so maybe these are those who grew up in the church or um, they know some scripture or maybe they're you know uh, they're not completely ignorant but they just I don't want to go there yeah I'm not going to church um, I'm not going to listen to any online ministries because what do these people know? They don't have, uh, they're not ordained, you know, whatever the reason might be, but they just don't engage. They don't enter in engagement. Okay. And the Lord says that they do not mature. They don't mature. They don't mature. What does that mean? The Lord is saying that after a certain time, right? Jesus, he was ministering all of his life. Yes, he was a kid. He was ministering when he was 12. He was ministering all of his life. And his ministry at 12 looked a little different than his ministry at 30. And the Lord is saying that there should be, there's a maturation process that is happening as you live, as you breathe, and as you engage God. Come on, as you engage God. But when you deprive yourself of that engagement, or we can say when you are deprived of that engagement, it thwarts your maturation. You might be able to um, recognize the word of God when it's being spoken. Okay, that's hearing. You might be able to um, recall some scripture and, and, and you know, um, accurately place that scripture for whatever, whatever the need is. Okay, that's the second category. You might be able to... Um, let me see here. Let me just take a look here. You might be able to, having 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 acquired all of that ability, you might be able to, in a time of trouble, try you know try to comfort yourself or comfort somebody else with it, right? You might know that, oh my gosh, when every you know the stuff has hit the fan and the rain's falling and my friend just can't get a break, I'm gonna to talk to her about the serenity prayer. You know, I'm gonna to talk to her about serenity, right? But because you've not engaged God, perhaps the way that you go about that is a little immature. 
perhaps um, because you've not spent a lot of time in Christ. You, maybe you've not spent enough time reading the Word, that you're not as familiar with ways of maneuvering certain situations. So, if we are using that example, your friend is upset, the rain is falling, and everything's hitting the fan, her world is breaking. And instead of sitting with her, um, instead of embracing her, perhaps like Elijah embraced the Tishabite's woman, the, the Tishabite woman's son, who had fallen ill and and passed away. Instead of embracing her, now Elijah laid his body over the child who was dead. But instead of embracing embracing this woman and maybe. You know, depending on her style, you embrace her and you just sit with her in silence as she weeps or you hear her complaints, but you pray in the spirit. Um, you watch her maybe kind of grumble and her countenance be disturbed and you start singing a worship song, right? To change the atmosphere because you're not mature. You've not reached through engaging Christ, Christ, excuse me, your maturation has not reached the point where it should be to be able to handle these things, right? You fall, you fall, you find yourself among the thorns. That becomes an uncomfortable situation. Um, perhaps that friend of yours responds adversely, right? And she's mad at you, like, and she whips you, you know, with a comment, and she says. Don't hit me over the head with scripture. You know, it becomes, because you didn't really work it the best, it becomes a, a, host, a hostile situation, it could, or it just becomes really uncomfortable. And, um, and then you feel ineffective. And this is the benefit of spending time with God. When we sit with him, when we engage him, when we make it our business to know him, then, in doing so, we receive his likeness in a, in a fuller way. And so lastly, he goes on to say, but the seed on good soil, this is the fourth and final category. He says, now that seed on good soil, it stands for those with a noble and good heart, those who hear the word, retain the word and by persevering produce a crop come on somebody think about the seed think about the journey of a seed the time that it's implanted into the soil the time it starts to take root these are adversities a seed has to exert force and energy and work to be able to extend those roots down into the soil to reach the water right to reach the water that's at the at the base of the soil to then just bring that water back up right bring it up the roots up the shaft to be to begin to sprout the leaves and then the leaves have to work to breach the top of the soil so it can get to the sunlight. Come on, somebody. Persevering to produce a crop. Come on, somebody. We are in Holy Week. We are in Resurrect Resurrection Week. Yesterday, Jesus walked through Jerusalem. He walked through as people were laying palms down at his feet. Oh my gosh, trying not to get emotional. He's laying palms down at his feet. The donkey is there. Jesus begins to sit on the donkey and he's riding through Jerusalem. It's a high point. But in his mind, in his soul, within him, he knows what he has to do. And although he's enjoying, you know, um, the community, although he's enjoying 
what's before him. He's enjoying, he's present with the moment. He's engaging where he's at. He's engaging time. He knows mentally, spiritually, emotionally, he has to persevere because he knows, he knows what has to happen next Sunday. He knows. He knows what has to take place on Saturday. Come on. He knows what has to come about on Friday. Okay? He has to persevere because the crop that he's going to produce, the crop that he's going to produce is the everlasting. I was so touched when I read Jesus said that he has come here to do his father's work and that in doing so, he's going to see to it that not one of those who the Lord has marked, not one of those who the Lord has called unto him, not one of those whom the Lord has said belongs to him shall be lost. And when we think about Jesus' life, this series is dedicated to telling the story. When we think about the life that Jesus lived, the adversities that he faced, and through all of that, the miracles that he worked, the people that he drew unto him, and ultimately the salvation that he won for us all, is something to really celebrate. And it's something to really rejoice about. So, I'm going to leave it here for now. I want to thank you so much for joining part one of the Luke 8 series. And I hope... Uh, that throughout this week you will you will read reread the scripture think about what we've discussed and recall the story for yourself recall the story of your salvation because it began with Jesus and it happened it, it, it was completed within this week I really enjoy you guys um, I want to thank you so much if this is your first time visiting the channel and you like what you've heard, um, if you believe in what we're doing, uh, just go ahead and support us with a like. Uh, commit to helping us evangelize by sharing this video. And make sure that you subscribe so that you, you know, won't miss out on the next video. Click that notification bell and, um, and that should do it. All right, you guys, until next time.